better go got quite a, a few things to to get through um lots of amazing sort of um things to share from different well-being uh, providers um we'll also make a start on just looking at a few sort of um theory things just trying to understand that sort of post-traumatic journey um a little better and um where you know different practices might um help um somebody yeah on this way there um, so just to introduce myself, I'm, I'm Catherine. Um, so at the moment, I'm setting up an organisation called Trauma Informed First Aid. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in a, a slide or two. And um, it's uh, World Mental Health Day today. Um, so the 2023 theme was um, mental health is a human right. So there's been quite a lot of, um, yeah, uh, people sort of sharing things about um positive mental health today which has been nice to see uh, so um yeah um this event is sort of marking that day so i think we'll make a start um so i'd like to uh first of all dedicate this um presentation uh to anyone who's on a recovery journey uh from a traumatic experience um and also anyone walking along with them, um, providing signposts to sort of guide the way. And also sadly, the, the people that we, we've lost um, on, on their journeys um, towards recovery who, who sadly didn't um, make it um, uh, today. So um, I mentioned World Mental Health Day. Uh, so yeah, that is, um, I, I guess, a, a celebration in some ways, uh, but also, yeah, um, thinking about mental health and, um, to be honest, every day should be a um, mental health day. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, um, today is the one uh, marked in the calendar. So, so just a quick introduction on the agenda for the sort of uh, webinar. Um, so first, just going to introduce the concept of trauma informed first aid. So what it is I'm trying to sort of set up there. And then we're just going to look at um, self-care, self-help. Um, where does that fit in someone's post-traumatic care uh, journey? And maybe, you know, are there other things which uh, we build around um, someone, you know, if you do sometimes need some extra support there. So we'll have a little look at a, a model for where sort of the self-care would come into this. Um, I've then got a little example of a, a post-traumatic uh, journey. So broken into some different sort of phases um, and just as a discussion point really around where different techniques could be helpful for someone and um, yeah uh, put in a spotlight of some different options for recovery. Uh, there's a few sort of uh, then sort of frameworks um, so I'm not sure if anyone's heard of the five ways of well-being um, just some other models somatic care that um, we can sort of use as lenses to look at um, post-traumatic care uh, so different ways we can think about, um, yeah, how how to sort of provide that sort of self care piece um, within the sort of uh, traumatic uh, care sort of landscape. And uh, finally, we've got our well being provider spotlight. So um, we've got, I think, it's about ten uh, well being providers. Uh, some of them have sent in videos um, because they couldn't be here uh, today, unfortunately, and others are on the call uh, with us today. So um, yeah, we'll be. Um, doing a bit of a showcase there. I'm just trying to work out if there's a way to stop this racing ahead, but um, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, we'll, we'll just make do um, <laughs> for now. I don't want to be faffing around too much there, so. Okay, so um, trauma-informed first aid or uh, so um, I guess sort of what is it and where um, the, the ideas sort of came from. So um, essentially it came out of my own experience. I used to be a Red Cross first aid trainer and actually experienced quite a traumatic um, accident. And then, well, the next week I was back in the training room and um, suddenly everything that was theory before became really real to me. And uh, certain things about the training became actually very triggering um, and I, I could go as far as saying it might have been post-traumatic stress um, and unfortunately I got to the point where I couldn't actually carry on delivering uh, training which was something I really loved um, before that accident and it sort of got me thinking um, there's not really um, 
a space where somebody can go to learn first aid in a way which is sort of designed not to be uh, re-triggering or re-traumatizing at all. Um, so I wanted to really create that space. So um, I, I guess the, the idea then of trauma-informed training uh, came along. Uh, so part of what I want to do is around post-traumatic care, uh, post-traumatic self-care. So um, after you've experienced the traumatic first aid incident, um, you know, how, how do you um, get back to your, your normal day-to-day -day, uh, life um, without that affecting you too much? Um, there's also quite a lot of things to sort of take into account during an emergency um, that having a sort of awareness of trauma can actually help us to understand. So for example, if you have a fight or a flight or even a sort of temporary freeze response during an emergency, I mean, that's actually quite normal. It's the emergency itself, which is not normal. So it's sort of understanding first aid through that sort of traumatic um, viewpoint really. Um, and so trauma-informed training, and it's sort of split that into sort of two um, areas. So the first oh, is uh, trauma-enhanced uh, first aid. So this is a quite specific intervention for um, someone who's, who's experienced a traumatic accident or emergency. Uh, so it's sort of combining wellbeing activities with your first aid training um, and also sort of a peer support model. So having lots of people with a similar experience around first aid on the same course, um, because peer support can be really um, beneficial in sort of recovery uh, context. So we've got lots of other examples of where peer support has been used. So um, alcohol and anonymous um, veteran support groups. So, um, you know, it's quite a, a well-used model for what? recovery. I'm here um, to the kitchen. Could I come just here. ask everyone to pop themselves on mute? I'm getting a few sort of um, interruptions coming through. So um, there we go. Okay. Um, so um, final sort of aspect of this sort of trauma enhanced training is um, psychoeducation. So learning about uh, trauma. So learning to understand your response. So whether it's uh, disassociation or um, whether you're hyper aroused, uh, we'll be looking at some of these things later on in the talk. Um, so it's um, understanding those things can actually help us in some ways become a better first aider, but also to understand our, our trauma response and put that into a sort of um, a, a normal context. So, you know, it's a normal reaction. Um, and um, I would be quite interested in uh, researching whether this type of intervention could actually be effective to help people to sort of integrate their trauma into their lives and move past it. So um, I am hoping to work with um, uh, some researchers to really get an evidence base, you know, does this work for people as uh, a way of uh, overcoming um, or well, a contributing factor to sort of getting over trauma? Um, you know, it's always going to be multiple things that um, are part of your recovery journey, not just, you know, one course. It's not sort of a silver bullet. Um, so final thing on here, um, trauma inform your training courses. So um, I'd like to do some work with first aid trainers. Um, uh, so just uh, anyone who teaches first aid. Um, it's really just about understanding um, perhaps some of your learners in the room. For them, it's not theory. It's actually real what you're talking about. Um, and, you know, how can you deliver the training in a way which isn't actually going to um, sort of re-traumatise them? Um, so, yeah, looking at developing some guidance for first aiders and also including things like, you know, signposting, sort of integrating uh, mental health first aid into your, your sort of first aid uh, course, really. Um, so, yeah, that, that's sort of um, the project of so where this sort of idea came out of uh, for the webinar. And if we skip ahead to the next slide, um, so we've got a little bit model here. So I'm just going to talk you through this um, quickly. So it's called the, the window of tolerance or um, optimal arousal there. And um, essentially the window of tolerance is um, basically the levels at which you can sort of function normally. So if you see that little gray line in the background there, um, that's within your window of tolerance. So sometimes you're going to be stressed. You get, you know, these sort of approaching this upper limit of your window of tolerance. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, you'll be quite relaxed, um, possibly even a bit sad. You know, you you might um, be sort of lower down in, in this sort of um, space. Um, I guess the key thing is um, we're always sort of remaining within this window of tolerance um, normally. So 
um, you know, you have ups, you have downs, um, but uh, nothing there is going to, um, yeah, cause sort of um, any sort of symptoms perhaps or uh, trauma. Um, then we sort of add in a traumatic event. Um, so this could be, it could be you've done first aid in a traumatic accident or emergency. Um, it could also be something like a, a bereavement, especially a traumatic bereavement. Um, it could be, um, well, all, all bereavements are traumatic, of course, um, but um, yeah. Um, so th there's many other things. Um, I won't go into details, um, but you could probably, you know, think of your experience um, of, of life and there might be one or two things which as you might say have been traumatic for you. And we see this, it kind of has a, a bit of an effect on um, your um, positioning within this window of tolerance. Um, so you can actually get to the point where you actually go beyond what you can tolerate. So this, um, in this diagram is called hyper arousal, where you're, you're sort of stuck on. Um, we could also call it a sort of mental health crisis. And um, some of the sort of symptoms we commonly associate to post-traumatic stress disorder might sort of fit in that category. So inability to sleep, insomnia, um, it could be sort of hyper vigilance, um, always being alert. And um, it can also affect the body. So you can have um, the uh, digestive problems, uh, pain, um, and um, very sort of startled. You, you might have tensed uh, muscles. Uh, so all of these things that they're sort of, you're stuck in that fight flight mode. Uh, so you're you're kind of like ready to run from a lion or a, a tiger, um, except in this situation, I guess the, the tiger is not sort of, uh, something we can run away from. So um, if you're stuck in this period for too long, you, you can also develop things like psychosis. If you haven't been able to sleep for a long time, that's a common sort of factor there. So um, we, we do need to uh, perhaps um, reach out for support if we are in this sort of hyper aroused space. Um, you know, there are things um, we can do to help uh, bring us back into the window of tolerance. And some of the exercises we're looking at later will be sort of examples of that. So particularly things like the, the trauma release exercises that can get you back down to that um, window of tolerance again. Uh, yoga, that's quite effective, I guess, at regulating your nervous system. Um, on the other hand, you can actually drop down. Uh, so if you're stuck off or um, we'd say like a chronic freeze, um, sometimes I think depression can be sort of um, mixed in with this or confused with um, sort of hypo arousal. So you're outside of that window of tolerance, but in a way that you're just feeling completely sort of flat, um, you could be um, sort of dissociated from your feelings. Uh, so uh, it's a sort of, I guess, adaption your brain does to try and protect you, I guess, from some of the trauma. But in the process, you know, it shuts us down. Um, and like this little person here, you know, you, you might not be enjoying life to, to the full extent. So sometimes we might need something to bring us back into that window of tolerance um, where we are down. So we've got, um, for example, mental health swims are going to be talking about uh, cold water swimming and how that might affect you. And uh, yeah, other examples of how you can remain within that window. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess one of the things with um, post-traumatic care is actually recognizing things. So learning to recognize when your muscles are tense uh, so that you can relax them and learning to recognize when you're sort of heading down and you might need some support to get back to that sort of um, even keel again. Uh, so yeah, that, that's your sort of window of tolerance diagram there, which kind of put things in a little bit of perspective. Um, jumping on to the next slide. Um, so this is all about self-care, so the, the pyramid of services for mental health. And um, we're just having a sort of think about where um, self-care fits in all of this. Um, so I'll just talk you through this diagram. Uh, so on the left, we have an arrow, uh, the frequency of use. So the ones down the bottom here are used very frequently. The ones at the top are uh, less frequently. So we go from sort of self-care, informal community care and sort of groups um, in society. Uh, then we've got um, our sort of formal services. So in, in the UK, we've got the NHS, so primary mental care services. Um, there's then this next level. So it could be psychiatric services in a general hospital or community mental health services. So 
at the moment, there's really sort of a push towards the community model of mental health services, um, keeping people in a space which is um, sort of familiar and safe to them rather than a hospital, which can be quite a stressful, uh, disorientating environment. So um, there's actually, I can share a, a post um, up at the moment uh, looking at sort of facilitating the move from hospital into sort of community mental health service. Um, at the top, we've got our long stay facilities and specialist psychiatric services, so less used, um, but um, very important um, sort of if people do need that sort of level of um, care. So it's a whole sort of, um, yeah, spectrum there. Going down, we've got the costs. So um, obviously the long stay facilities and specialist psychiatric services are quite expensive. Whereas um, if we go down to sort of the self-care, informal community care, it can be just, uh, sort of, you know, a membership model for a yoga class, perhaps, or um, even some exercises you can do at home without needing, um, you know, to buy into anything. There's a lot of um, resources on um, the Internet and things and um, providers often um, have sort of a level of service that you can access um, on your own um, or, you know, you can learn techniques which you can then implement um, in your sort of home environment. There. So for the purpose of this webinar, um, we're going to be looking at these uh, bottom two, mostly informal service, so community care, uh, community care models and self-care. Um, but also noticing that self-care, you know, it doesn't stop at this level. So if you are in a primary mental care health service, uh, you need to do self-care as well. Uh, same with sort of community mental service and psychiatric um, hospitals. There might be facilitated ways to do self-care so there might be say occupational therapy and art classes in a psychiatric um, hospital or sort of support groups and football groups perhaps um sports groups are quite a good um sort of model of providing that sort of space for self-care within that community mental health setting um as well as on a sort of more informal community uh level which um we'd say more sort of well-being rather than sort of anything um, yeah, beyond that, really. So these two things are, are the sort of focus of this webinar. Um, the other bits are really important as well, um, but we won't have time to go through all of that today. Um, so signposting, I just wanted to sort of quickly display this uh, sign. So sometimes it's really important to recognise that you may need um, more than just self-care. So if you're in a mental health crisis, um, if someone um, you're worried that um, they are having uh, sort of suicidal thoughts or thoughts of self-harming, um, you know, these are things which would need um, crisis support. So in some circumstances, that's a 999 call. If you're worried about that person uh, hurting themselves uh, or, or others. Um, and there are actually other sort of um, places you can go. So we've got some examples here. Uh, so uh, papyrus, um, is, has a hopeline so anyone who themselves is um, struggling with suicidal thoughts can actually call that number and, and speak to someone um, getting that sort of um, help um, straight away there. Um, the campaign against living uh, miserably they've uh, identified I think 75% uh, of, sort of young suicides are, are male so um, you know they have specific um, support uh, for that sort of group as well and a web chat service. I know we've got a few people from the university on the call today. So Nightline is the student uh, support line. Uh, so they can give, uh, yeah, nighttime listening services to students um, and um, other sort of specific providers. So um, Switchboard for LGBTQ plus um, people identifying in that sort of category. Um, so these are just six, but there's hundreds of different organisations out there. Um, I, I find that lots of people who've been through a traumatic experience, they they kind of want to sort of signpost the way for people having that same sort of um, traumatic recovery journey as themselves. So um, just letting people know they're not alone. Um, you know, you're never alone, but there's always someone else who's had a, a very, very sort of similar experience. Um, and quite often, you know, people do come out the other side. So even if your brain's telling you there's no hope, um, I don't believe it because, you know, things do change and there is um, help out there. So, um, yeah, don't be afraid to, if you feel that you need uh, to call one of these numbers yourself or you think someone else could benefit um, 
from that sort of signpost, then um, it is great if you can provide that sort of direction to uh, people who are experts in sort of mental health recovery. Um, so uh, on to our next slide. Um, so a little post uh, recovery, uh, post traumatic recovery example, really. So at the top, we've got different sort of times um, starting from the traumatic event itself, whatever that is, um, to that sort of immediate aftermath. Um, how do you look after your body? Because um, I think it's becoming increasingly known that our body does keep the scores. So um, trauma can be sort of held in the body and um, we need to sort of work out how we can release that trauma. Rest and recovery, um, it is uh, crucially important in terms of recovery. So that might be um, getting better sleep, uh, finding strategies to improve your sleep, it might be taking some time off to sort of process things. And finally, we've got that sort of rehabilitation. Um, so that's where you're sort of working on that trauma, reprocessing it and moving past it. So just to quickly run through some of these examples. So in this sort of traumatic event, so, um, I'm trying to develop some resources on the fight, flight, um, what well, could be a temporary freeze, and sort of trying to convert that over to a place where we're actually able to provide first aid. So that section of a website, we've got sort of, uh, advice from the Red Cross. Um, and I'm trying to get some sort of um, military guidance as well for how to keep calm in a crisis. So uh, trying to get some of that sort of uh, information available there. Don't forget, there's always 999. So in an emergency, um, you know, you can pick up the phone and have someone on the end of the phone whose job it is to respond to emergency calls. And, you know, they've had lots of training, they can provide guidance, they can help you through that situation. So getting that um, sort of link to 999 is really crucial in terms of um, making sure we get the sort of right response for the casualty, as well as the right support for ourselves as a first aider or whatever other circumstance you, you find yourself in there. Uh, our breath can be really amazing actually so um, by controlling your breath you can control your emotions to some extent uh, so um, in first aid training we often say you know take a deep breath before you go into that emergency and don't go running into emergency so deep breath walk in and try and keep that logical part of the brain going as opposed to the sort of um more uh, old part of your brain, which is more your, your fight or flight uh, type um, reaction, which is a natural reaction, um, but one as a first aider, um, we want to try and um, regulate um, that if we can, uh, sometimes that's not possible. Um, and psychological first aid, so um, this is sort of first aid, um, kind of like mental health first aid for a crisis. And the reason I popped it in there is sometimes um, we ourselves uh, need to take um, first aid, um, so psychological first aid or um, other first aid. So it's, it's just trying to work with um, someone who's trying to help you um, in order to help yourself. So um, trying to sort of engage with anyone who's uh, helping you um, through a traumatic event there. So immediately after um, a sort of traumatic emergency, it can be helpful to debrief. Uh, so if, say, for example, you're involved in a very serious um, accident, um, you may actually be asked to do a on the spot sort of statement for the police so they can sort of work out what happened there. So particularly if there's been a fatality. So that sort of process of explaining what happened, explaining, you know, what uh, you did as a first aider to try and help. For, um, it can be quite helpful for just kind of trying to get some process to what has been like a very stressful situation. Um, following signposts, so um, there are lots of signposts out there. So people might um, point you in the direction of crisis support. Uh, so, you know, do reach out for that help if, if someone has suggested um, that you could benefit from that. Um, I've also got a link there to uh, post-traumatic guidance. It's a document produced from the British Red Cross um, with some guidance. Um, for example, that it can help to connect with loved ones after an, an emergency. Um, so um, lots of other sort of tips there. And it sort of talks you uh, through what's normal to experience after an emergency, as well as things you can do to try and, um, yeah, sort of regulate your, your emotions and get back to your um, uh, window of tolerance there. Um, so yeah, aftercare and bodywork or somatic uh, 
Okay, so we've got a few speakers on this um, who will shortly be um, talking us through some techniques such as uh, tapping uh, or emotional freedom technique, EFT, and trauma release exercises. So um, I want to speak about those two. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of the TIP technique before. Um, so it stands for temperature, intense exercise, paced uh, breathing, and progressive muscle relaxation. So uh, this is something my friend um, Joel shared with me when I was going through a tough time and it really helped um, to get back into that window of tolerance from a place of um, hyper arousal so where I was um, on and sort of um, hyper vigilant. Um, that's cold water um, and warm water, uh, the intense exercise um, and uh, well you'd never catch me running normally, um, paced breathing so really focusing on that sort of breath and um, the, the progressive muscle relaxation, another really brilliant technique. It can really just help you sort of regulate your body back into um, a space where you're a bit more sort of comfortable. Massage can also be um, useful. So um, myofascial uh, release um, releases tension and um, sometimes a deep tissue massage can help uh, release tension, especially that which has been there for perhaps in some cases years. Um, it can help us to yeah release that tension. Um, rest and recovery. So um, sleep is so crucial in mental health. So um, you often find, you know, if you've had a bad night's sleep, the next day is going to be difficult. But if you've had five bad nights sleep or five nights no sleep, then things can start to go more towards that sort of mental health crisis space. So um, finding ways to help ourselves relax and then sleep it is really important. So it might need some time off work um, to sort of process things as well. Uh, so we'll come on to the five ways of well-being later. It's just sort of a, a model um, for how we can sort of think about well-being and uh, self-care um, in a post-traumatic sense or, or just generally. Uh, so we'll look at that um, in a little moment. Uh, journaling, so writing stuff down um, and, and talking to people that can help. Uh, being out in nature, uh, so some lovely speakers um, on sort of ecotherapy coming up as well in this next part of the, the talk. And the final sort of step, uh, the rehabilitation, so reprocessing and integrating that trauma into who we are today. Uh, so that might be through trauma counselling, um, it might be through uh, therapy, so EMDR is particularly uh, a good uh, therapy for trauma. Uh, if it's a sort of a, a single traumatic event, that can be a very good sort of um, intervention there. Um, so um, if you want to find out more about EMDR, I'd recommend um, Bessel van der Kolk's book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score, to find out a little bit more about this uh, new sort of technique there. And finally, I've popped in my trauma-informed first aid training in the sort of rehabilitation space. So, you know, the last thing you want to do immediately after a traumatic accident is be in a context which reminds you directly of that traumatic accident. So, you know, this is something that we work up to and um, perhaps something which can help us to integrate that trauma, but perhaps it's not something that would come right at the beginning of this journey. After all, it is a journey, so we have to work through, you know, step by step. Um, it's not a race. Um, okay. Another quick model. Um, so this is from Mind Body Breakthrough. Um, I went on the, uh, the Mind uh, Trauma and Recovery course. Um, and that was actually a really fantastic course. And um, I just wanted to introduce you to this sort of a diagram. So it might look a little complicated, but we've actually just got the, the self before the trauma, yourself during the trauma, and yourself after the, the trauma. Uh, so we want to kind of get to the space where we can bring all three versions of ourselves together. Um, but um, yeah, you don't want to start perhaps with the traumatic self. So maybe looking back to um, pre-traumatic self. So what did you do before um, as a uh, sort of resource for recovery? So what did you enjoy doing, which brought you joy? Um, what sort of relaxed you? What sort of techniques have you built up in your life to deal with stress? which can be sort of applied then to this sort of trauma context um, that we find ourselves in. Um, so the post-traumatic self, so that's where you, you kind of want to be um, or uh, where you are sort of after the, um, the traumatic experience. Um, and we want to sort of recover this by re-establishing our, our sense of self, 
by sort of getting in connection with life again. So things like mindfulness, uh, creativity, community, uh, these are all things that can help us uh, create that sort of positive future intention and that sort of moving forwards rather than keeping on looking back. Uh, so um, to some extent, we need to sort of, um, yeah, reconnect um, who we used to be with, with who we are now. Um, but also recognising that we might have changed a bit um, given we've had a traumatic experience. And sometimes we actually need to uh, sort of reprocess that traumatic experience into something which kind of fits more with our, our sort of, um, yeah, getting rid of any sort of defrag uh, fragmentation um, of the self. So things like, you know, EMDR, talking therapy, it can help us to integrate um, that sort of, um, yeah, emotional, um, traumatized self with um, who we are sort of today. All of those uh, things together, so the safety, integration and reconnection, we can go towards this sort of space of personal coherence where um, you, um, you know, you have trauma in your past, you can't change that, um, but you can change how you sort of respond to it, how you um, sort of see yourself and where you're going in your life. So, um, yeah, there are lots of great examples of people who have come through um, a traumatic experience and actually made sort of um, lemons into lemonade out of their sort of life experiences there. So this um, is final model, and then I'll be handing over to um, the sort of, uh, guests I have on the webinar to talk about uh, some sort of concrete examples of um, what we've been talking about so far. Um, so just to go through, uh, first of all, sleep, that is so important for mental health. And a lot of these things actually do contribute to um, getting a good night's sleep. So being active, so uh, being out and about, um, especially if it's in nature, sort of taking notice of that, connecting with others. Uh, so when we are sort of in a frightened state, um, by sort of being with someone who's not uh, frightened, it's sort of called a co-regulation. So you can kind of go back into that window of tolerance again. Um, by sort of connecting with people. It can also be very helpful to connect with people who've had a similar experience to what you've had. So joining a support group um, or uh, sort of reaching out, you know, if you know someone's been through something similar, um, you know, you might share the, the similar sort of recovery journey. So you might be able to help each other uh, by sort of that, that connection there. Um, somatic body care, uh, so this is, that sort of recognition that uh, trauma, it's not just in the mind, it can be in the body as well. So it's that mind-body connection, sort of that understanding, um, sort of learning to know how we feel and learning how to manage our uh, sort of physical and uh, emotional sort of state. So um, we'll be looking at some examples there of somatic care. And in the middle, this is our, our sort of five ways of well-being, which it's a very popular framework in well-being and mental health, but I think it gives quite a nice sort of framework to um, just understanding how different uh, things can uh, help us in our recovery journey. Okay, uh, so um, we have our first well-being providers here to share um, sort of their practice and experiences, ways that can help you um, sort of um, on that sort of recovery journey there. Uh, so we're going to start off with uh, Wale Ladipo, who runs the uh, um, Mind Body Breakthrough um, psychoeducational um, training, which um, was absolutely fabulous, I have to say. And this should link through to a YouTube video. So, hello everyone. There is Wale Ladipo here, director and lead therapist at Mind Body Breakthrough Organization. We specialize in mental health. So we use psychoeducation to empower people towards compassion. And as we think about post-traumatic stress disorder, it's a condition that affects both the mind and body. The mind is affected massively because of the shock, the horror of the traumatic situations that we've been exposed to. And because of that, the body somatizes the trauma. So mind and body connection basically get severed. The extent that people start to feel numbed out in their body. You feel frozen, you feel disconnected. 
from your authentic self. Regarding self-care, self-care begins with psychoeducation. In my opinion, once you understand that you're not to be blamed, you're not weird for having the symptoms that you're going through, the complexity of the symptoms that we go through and we blame ourselves for. Once we have the right education that the brain is involved, the environment reshapes the brain and the brain moves into a defense state where it starts to exaggerate our stress responses and our, our, our shutdown responses and the body will express that. So the first prerequisite, in my opinion, is the right understanding that much of what we blame ourselves for have been accounted for by research that the brain is involved in the symptoms. We struggle to pay attention, to focus, to impulse control. Those are all non you know, cognitive conditions that studies have implicated in PTSD. If you have issues with memory, if you have a whole bunch of triggers in your body, if you have sensory processing issues, if you, if you struggle in emotional relationships, if you struggle in emotional regulation, if you have flashbacks, night terrors, nightmares, if you, if you experience uh, somatic expressions of anxiety, panic attacks, starter responses, all those things have been linked to trauma response. And if you struggle to really do interpersonal relationships, you get triggered easily through, with intimacy, with, with commitment, you, uh, you have issues with trust. All those things are consistent with what studies have shown to be involved in complex trauma. So therefore, the self-care element is that we use the psychoeducation to now start to experience or experience self-care, self-compassion. Self-compassion is the foundation upon which recovery is built. You are not weird. You are a trauma survivor. And that is what we try to give our clients at Mind Body Breakthrough. And after that, the safety element is important. Feeling safe now is the most important intervention. Our environment, uh, with our relationships, with our, uh, our, our bodily symptoms. So safety is important. And one of the components of safety is to ensure that you do some somatic work because not all traumatic memories are organized at the cognitive and verbal level. Some of them are split and fragmented into the body. And body memory requires mindful movement, whether it's yoga or Pilates or, um, or Tai Chi or Karate or acupuncture, anything that is considered body oriented can be part of the overall recovery plan, care, the recovery care plan to move us towards recovery. So safety of the body, safety of your brain. So we have to figure out to reduce inflammation so that the brain feels safe. Uh, excess inflammation caused by trauma makes the brain not to communicate very well. The neurons don't share information the way they're supposed to share. And that will affect behaviors, tendencies, that will, that will affect our capacity to focus, to use our thinking brain to plan our future. And that will affect how we regulate emotions. So a whole bunch of safety work is necessary to establish stabilization. After which we can then move to integration where we process emotions at a deeper level. Co-regulation we find is very crucial. Co-regulation is when it's supportive for them who has the skills to help you through emotions is available and is attuned to be able to help you through your situations. So it's not a quick fix, PTSD. 
But once we have the right safety, the right understanding, the right support, gradually, steadily, we continue to make um, uh, progress. Then afterwards, we look at reconnection, how to reconnect back to passion, to purpose, to dreams that have been suspended because of our PTSD. How to reconnect back to life. Then life gradually reconnects back to us. So it's one of the people here wishing you the very best in this period of mental health uh, day. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this and wishing you the very best. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Uh, fantastic. There. So, uh, Mind Body Breakthrough is the website to look at um, for sort of psychoeducation. Next, we have Sylvia Tillman introducing trauma release exercises, TIE. Well, thank you, Catherine, and um, thank you for your invitation. Um, I'm delighted that the focus seems to be on body work because this is so important. Um, I always find the default, and I was the same in the past, is cognitive therapies, and we need to talk things through, and we need to analyze what has happened, and so on and so on. It never did anything for me. I have a foundation training in counseling, but um, when I trained in TIE, um, it was an eye opener. It was really an eye opener. So TIE stands for Tension and Trauma Releasing Exercises. And I just want to give you a very, very brief overview um, and then also a very brief demonstration so you have an idea um, what it is about. And if you if you click the next slide, Catherine, um, I also want to say that um, somebody famously said, nobody talked you into it, whatever it is, of if it's anxiety or depression or PTSD, why do you expect you can talk yourself out of it? Um, so re supporting your body is definitely the key where I'm also coming from. And... Um, Catherine, your introduction was so amazing, and you 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 already yeah introduced so many yeah so much theory and so many so many things, but um, and I won't, don't want to go into um, fight or flight or freeze, but I just want to stress that our bodies are so amazing in supporting us in yeah scary or terrifying situation. If you go into the next slide, um, it's exactly. It is um, in the situation we get all the, the 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 energy and the power to either fight or flight and run away, and the the stress hormones help us to do that and to have the the strength and and yeah run or fight. But then when we don't run, which obviously nowadays we don't have the wild beast, um, the stress hormones still linger in our system, and it can kind of really increase our stress threshold. Um, we tense up and the muscles contract. And yeah, as we heard before, emotional pain is not just in the in the head and in the in the mind. It really is in the mus muscles too. In the muscles, the issues they say the issues are in the um, in the tissue, um, and the cycle of kind of production of so many stress hormones in order to help us. And then going back to a baseline, the cycle, Peter Levine says, needs to be completed. And completed ideally by, um, yeah, movement. I mean, in the old days, we were running or fighting. Now, many people find relief by um, running or exercising or going to the gym. And I want to show you um, how we do it in TAE. So TAE is tapping into our body's very natural and innate reaction to shake off, literally shake off stress like a dog does after a stressful inc incident. And I also want to point out next time you might be in a situation where you see somebody who's really in distress and they are shaking um, yeah, uncontrollably, our general, well, idea is we need to we need to calm this person down we need to tell them oh don't shake it's not so bad and it's you'll be fine don't don't let them give them space to really shake it off studies have shown and and it's a fact that when people go through a stressful incident 
are able and get the opportunity to really shake, whether it's wobbly knees or, or shaky hands, um, they get over this incident much, much easier. And this is our bo not natural body reaction. And that's what we kind of replicate in tier E, then obviously in the privacy of our own homes on the yoga mat. And I am just very briefly changing my um, screen so I can lie down and give you an idea. So in tier E, so you should see me on the mat, we work mainly and that's how it's, well, that's our main kind of point, the psoas muscle. We address the psoas muscle, also the muscle of the so uh, soul. And um, I now stretch my my thighs here in order to make the tremoring process a little bit easier. And then I'm in the butterfly position and then bring my knees towards, it other, towards each other gently and very slowly. And at one stage, so you can see that, I'm starting to shake. Every shake is different. This is my shake tonight. My body gives out and releases what my body wants to release. And also it comes from the brainstem. So the shaking is involuntary. That means I still form the brainstem. That means I can still kind of talk to you because the cognitive ability obviously is another part of that brain. I can't control the shaking. The only thing I can control is by stretching out my legs the shaking stops. And yeah, this is just really in a nutshell, um, a wee introduction and also a demonstration of TAE. So to give you an idea, um, also you might think that was weird. That's what your brain is telling you. But every client I work with says, well, it might be weird, but the relaxation I feel within my body or the pain I've experienced before the session is gone. And I just think it's tremendous. So if you want to find out how to heal yourself um, in a very innate and very natural way, my website is tremendoustie.co.uk. Thank you so much again for the opportunity, Catherine, to talk about TAE. Next up, we actually have a video uh, from Hugo and Sunny, um, therapy dog duo, and uh, Leslie, um, who speaks about um, therapy dogs and how they can help in a sort of post-traumatic context. So um, there's also, um, yeah, a, a little bit of um, sort of um, comic humour in, in this video um, at the end, um, where um, Sunny... Um, engages is some natural therapy as well. So we'll find out about this later on in the video. My name is Leslie Arnold and I volunteer um, with Pets as Therapy charity and I take my two dogs into various settings. This is Sunny, he's ten and a half and this is Hugo, he's nearly four. As you can see they are both golden retrievers. Therapy dogs are used in many different settings, for example in schools, in nursing homes, in hospitals, in dementia cafes, for informal sessions organized by organizations such as Bernardo's. Um, the list is quite extensive, but wherever they go, they sprinkle their magic and they just leave people feeling a lot better than before their arrival. Sunny has done a lot of work on dementia wards where patients connect with him at a very different level. Um, dementia patients who perhaps can't remember the names of their very close relatives will often remember his name. Sitting down in a chair all day, staff are perhaps unable to persuade them to move, but the appearance of a dog, they will willingly get up and interact and play games, and stroke and cuddle and groom him. They're also known to relieve stress and 
anxiety. I can give you some concrete examples of this. We could just be out walking with these boys and people will approach us and ask to stroke the dogs, which will usually um, engender a conversation. When we go into hospitals, the staff often like to have a, a, stro a stroke and a cuddle with the dogs because it helps to relieve any tensions they're feeling and just helps them get on with their day. The dogs are non-judgmental and loving. They don't know how to be any other way. I enjoy volunteering. It's extremely worthwhile. It's good to be able to put something back into the community as well. Plus, in many ways, it gives the dogs a true sense of purpose. When my daughter went through an extremely traumatic period in her life, she derived great comfort from being able to cuddle the dogs and have the dogs snuggle into her and just reassure her that everything was going to be okay. Hello. Yay! Good boy, you found a stick. Good boy. Hey, Sunny. Good boy. Okay, uh, so that was Sunny and Hugo, the therapy dogs. Next, we have a contribution from Ralph Alele talking about ecotherapy for PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is a global catastrophe that has been here long before now, and it is triggered by numerous actions as indicated in the attached mind map. Millions of pounds is invested yearly in medical remedies to PTSD, but that has not yielded a long-lasting solution. Today, nature-based remedy is one of the most effective and free solutions to PTSD. Woodlands, with their serene and natural environments, can have a positive impact on individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. The calming presence of trees, the rustling of leaves, and the fresh air can provide a therapeutic respite from the daily stresses and traumatic memories that plague those with PTSD. Forests offer a sense of tranquility and safety, reducing the hyperarousal often associated with the disorder. Engaging with nature in woodlands promotes mindfulness and relaxation, helping to alleviate symptoms of anxiety and flashbacks. Activities like forest bathing or hiking in wooded areas may serve as a form of ecotherapy, offering solace and fostering emotional healing for those affected by PTSD. Thank you. Presented by Ralph Olele Environmentalist Nine Tree CIC And um, next we have a video from Sam Lee. Um, if you like folk music, you might have heard of him. He's a conservationist, song collector and folk singer. And so it's about um, well-being in a more sort of city context, um, as well as um, being sort of out in the countryside. So I'm just going to share this video. 
Hey there, Sam Lee here, um, wishing you all well. Wanted to share this video with you about, about the power of nature and well-being. Um, I don't know about you, but I live in central London. This is about as green as it gets for me. I'm very lucky to have um, a few trees are not in my garden, but in the in the ground below, below where I live, which is uh, uh, as close as I get to these trees, but um, they go a bit of a way to support me in keeping me in a place of well-being and, uh, and, and looked after in some of the tough times. I'm a little bit concerned that as the autumn comes and these trees will be losing their leaves, that for me is a, always a big loss and need to work harder to maintain my sense of yeah, earthed groundedness, connection to nature. And um, one of the things I can say living in London, I'm very blessed with is there are a lot of green spaces, um, generally on transport links and cycle routes. <clears throat> and so if you are a city dweller, the making time is the most important thing because it's so easy for those who have great nature and beautiful space all around them to just step out with their dog or whatever and go for a walk. But I don't have that sort of immediate capability. So I have to make those gestures to fit that time in. Um, I don't know about you, but I work a lot during the day um, and find that the free time I have is at night. And so maybe what I would share with you is that um, we sometimes look at the night time as an impenetrable, excluding time where it's not safe to walk um, and uh, we are not allowed. But places like Hampstead Heath, um, some of the bigger parks uh, have uh, all night, 24 hour access. And one of the things I would say is about really honoring, particularly the times at dawn and dusk, just as it's getting dark, as places to go out and do some deep breathing, some walking, some getting into a pace, switching off from the mobile phone, listening listening to the birds this is a big one even this time of year when most of our migrant species have long since left the shores and we've got just a few resident songbirds the robins the blackbirds the thrushes giving a little tweet um it's well worth just going and bringing your ears to the attention of what other species we are blessed to be living with um, really easy to do some bird identification with apps like merlin or, or bird song tracker um, it's a really great way of getting out of the headspace, the, the very cortisol uh, overdriven, uh, stressed out head that we often live with. Um, and going and listening to birds, there is an amazing amount of communication there. Come spring next year, the prolific amount of bird song is amazing, but it's also amazing how many people don't really notice it. They'll feel a little bit better and the joys of spring will be there, but actually, are they paying attention really? Are we acknowledging that, that brilliant, beautiful thing that we have? So birds, I think, are a really wonderful way of connecting with nature. Likewise, phenomenal mushrooms that grow around at this time of year, even on city tree stumps and branches, well worth looking into. But allowing your curiosity to question how much nature is there around me and what does it look like? What's it doing? Why is it there? How has it survived in this urban grey environment? Uh, there's a lot of surviving going on in the natural world. So I encourage you to go out there. For more things on that, uh, check out some of the projects I do like seeing with nightingales, which takes people out into the woods at night in spring to listen and play music with the nightingales. Um, these are some of the deeper practices I do during the spring and summer months um, that I would love to share with you all. So thanks so much. So thanks so much. Okay, and thanks, Sam. That was a lovely video. I'm actually going to be on the um, Singing with Nightingales um, in April um, next year. Really excited about that. Uh, so that should be, yeah, um, really sort of, yeah, nice way to sort of get in touch with, with nature uh, again. Um, we've got our two videos left, and um, then it's actually over to you uh, to find out a little bit about um, your sort of um, wellbeing practices and, uh, yeah, how, how they've um, helped you. 
so next up, we have the Penarth Mental Health Swim Team uh, telling you about their next swim, uh, which is coming up in, um, I think it might be next weekend, um, but let's uh, see what they, they say to find out more. Hello, we are Frankie, Wendy and Lena, and we are the Penarth Mental Health Swim Swims Team. <laughs> and we are um, organising a swim on the 22nd of October and we would love for you to come and join us. We'll be swimming off the pier side in Penarth. And it's great for your mental health. We'll be meeting at nine, nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Yeah. Come and join us. In the morning. In the morning, not in the evening. <laughs> the, um, you can find the link um, on the website if you search Pinar um, Mental Health Swims on Instagram or, um, or if you Google it, the link should be there. It's great for your mental health and you get to come and meet us too. I and know. we're great. In a great, safe environment, yeah. great community. Um, come and meet us, come and see us. And it's not that cold. <laughs> no, it shouldn't be that cold. And if it is, we'll do like some star jumps or something afterwards. Okay, uh, so thanks there for the mental health swim teams. Um, I've been doing these for a couple of years now. I started um, in Shoreham and um, yeah, um, the one in Penarth. Um, looking forward to, um, well, it's going to be chilly, uh, but it's part of your tip technique, the, the temperature. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, a lovely community of people there as well. So um, I wonder if I'll meet any of you um, in the water in Penarth. Okay. Um, so uh, we're just going to move to our final video um, before moving on to some more sort of breakout activities and finding out a little bit more from you. So coming up now, and Sue's going to be talking about uh, tapping or EFT. Uh... Trigger warning. This video includes a case example from a client who experienced an armed robbery. Tapping and matrix reimprinting practitioner. So I'd like to talk to you today about these amazing, powerful techniques that can help with trauma. Even EFT on its own is a really good self-help tool. So first of all, let's start off, off with the basics. Let's look at the EFT, about what that is. So this is a really effective method for managing emotional and psychological issues. So it involves tapping on certain points on your head, face and, and your upper body. So let's just have a look at some of this. So here are some of the tapping points. So we'd start tapping on the side of the hand, which is called our karate chop area. And we start off with um, a statement. So even though I am, and it's whatever sort of belief you have or emotion that you have, or the situation you're in, um, I still deeply um, accept myself something along those lines and you're basically sort of tapping in tuning into that emotion um, from there we can tap from the top of the head to the inner eyebrow to the outer eyebrow under the eye under the nose very gently maybe about four or seven times under the mouth and you've got the collarbone about four inches under the armpit and then we can also do the wrist areas and the thumbs and fingers as we repeat some of those aspects so if it, if it is um, even though I'm overwhelmed with fear I still love and accept myself and then you could go around saying overwhelmed with fear overwhelmed with fear overwhelmed with fear overwhelmed with fear once we've done that that's called a round and after each round we tune into um, Imagine sort of on a scale one to ten how we're feeling. So initially, where were we? So one to ten, ten is really overwhelmed, and and zero is that that emotion is now not affecting you at all. So after a round, you would think, right, okay, where am I now? I'm on an eight, I'm on a seven. The idea is to continue to do those rounds until you get to a zero. So with um, EFT, how it works is that. By tapping on these points, these are the beginnings and the ends of meridians within your body. So this is a little bit like roadmaps, roadmaps of energy flowing through your body. So the tapping balances out this energy and it reduces the emotional intensity associated with that trauma. 
So that's your your EFT. So EFT on its own is a little bit about a little bit like have an EFT practitioner in your pocket. You can use it anytime, anywhere, whenever you're feeling just stressed, anxious, um, or sort of fear, even like sort of uh, driving over a bridge or something like that. So let's have a look at the matrix re-imprinting. So this is very much an advanced technique with EFT. And we go that little bit step further, looking into the memories of traumas and re-imprinting them so that at the end of it, you can still see the trauma, but in a different perspective and you've disassociated yourself with the emotions, but you re-imprinted some new emotions to make it um, a lot easier to deal with. So if I go through one of my um, one of my clients, obviously I've changed the name for confidentiality, but it gives you a good idea about how this works. So my client, 28-year-old Sarah, came to me struggling to um, deal with the trauma of a burglary, a house invasion. So she was actually in the house at the time. She was held at knife point. Um, obviously she came to me about a year later, she got through it, the, the man was arrested and so forth. But she had this constant fear that the world was a really dangerous place. It wasn't even safe in your own home. She didn't like to leave her house at all. Uh, she wasn't sleeping because even though she was in her house and had everything locked, she had that fear of it all happening again. So when Sarah first came to me, I introduced her to something called the the movie technique. So basically I said to Sarah, right, if if this event that you went through um, could be called a, a title of a movie, what would you call it? She called it the Survivor's Resolve. So that, that was her own taking. And I said to her, okay, if you could put sort of a time to this, how long was this actual trauma for? She said, well, the actual trauma, the real trauma was about 30 minutes. Okay. So then um, I introduced her to the tapping, explained what the tapping did, and introduced her to the concept of what an echo was. So an echo is um, always when you're in a meditative state, alpha, down to even theta, you can go back to that um, trauma, but as a bystander, as an observer. So I was wanting Sarah to go back to that event as a bystander so she could see her 27 year old self there. Sarah's now 28. So it's almost you're not being poured in and reliving that experience. You're not seeing it through the eyes of the 27 year old. You're a, you're a bystander. So I explained to Sarah that as I would gently tap on Sarah, in Sarah's mind, she would be tapping on her echo. So when she went into that memory, she would need to introduce herself to her 27 year old echo, explain who she was and that she was there to help and everything was going to be okay. And also asking her echo what her belief was that day. And the echo was saying that um, even though she was in her own, own house, and with all the, the all the locks, all the alarms, that it was going to be a, a very unsafe place and, and she wasn't going to get out of this um, alive. That was her thought at the time. So the reframing um, is almost me explaining things to Sarah, Sarah then explaining things to her echo to say, right, we have the ability at this moment in time to freeze and add any resources that you want to. So at the point when the perpetrator, the, the, the person invading the home, had Sarah at knife point, she just froze, the echo just froze that uh, memory. And she brought in resources that um, she imagined that she could go into deep uh, meditation and just concentrate on her breath as an anchor and become very calm. She also brought in the resource of um, the intruder's very loving mother was on the other side of the glass on some ladders because this is on the, the second floor of the house. And she also visualised coming in the most best counselling person ever who was on the other side of the bedroom door 
who would then be able to talk to this intruder and convince him to just give up and get some help and support. So the idea is that when we go through all of this, we're talking it through. And if at any point um, the echo is getting very stressed, Sarah will, in her mind's eye, be tapping, using the tapping points on the echo just to keep her calm so she could logically see herself through this. And also re-imprinting is bring, bringing in extra things. So you can't erase what's happened. She was burgled, she was held at knife point, but you can bring in additional things. So Sarah's echo is also bringing in sort of the, the feeling of the calm, these additional people that would um, be able to talk this intruder out of what he was um, planning to carry out. She also was bringing in this feeling of um, a protective light around her, a protective bubble, that everything would be okay. So once all of this was brought in, Sarah was then able to ask her echo, right, everything's going to be okay now that the man's been taken away, you are safe. Is there somewhere that, where you would really like to be right now? And her echo would say, I think she'd said on her notes that she wanted to just be in the middle of a, a meadow on a beautiful hot sunny day on a picnic with her very closest, closest family, her sisters and mum and dad, brother and so forth. Um, from that, I wanted then Sarah to... Again, go back down into Alpha, go back to, into, into Theta and just picture what her echo was saying. Um, so her echo had gone through about, right, okay, so th this is what happened. Her echo actually ended up handing a handkerchief to the intruder when he started crying and collapsing on the floor, sobbing. And then the counsellor came through and the, and the bedroom window was open and his mother crawled through. And then... Sarah's own mother came and picked up the echo and took her downstairs. So it's almost like, okay, so what, what was everyone wearing? What was the colour of the, the walls? What smells could you smell? You could still smell the pizza from when you had a pizza downstairs earlier. Um, you could see that the sun beginning to rise. It was very early hours of the morning. And everyone just felt such relief. Um, and happiness that this man was actually very mentally ill and he was going to get help and Sarah's echo was all very very safe and about to go off for a picnic. So in Sarah's um, sort of like meditative state is almost taking all those senses down through the top of her hair down to her heart making it spread out to all the cells in her body so it's almost like you really felt that that was what was happening. That was the good emotions, the good feelings. And then I would finally sort of say to Sarah, you can open your eyes, take a breather. And then when I ask Sarah to go back in to that memory, does she have any um, emotions, disturbing emotions still there? If there were any, that means we've missed some certain emotional aspects and we need to go back and clear those as well. But generally that's what clears it. So that's your um, EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique, and your matrix re-imprinting. So I hope you uh, had a good overview of that. And if you wish to connect, please feel free to have a look at my website, www.reachingwithin.co.uk. Thank you so much for connecting and listening to me today. Um, just a, a quick um, sort of, um, I guess, promotion. So if you actually want to become a partner of Trauma-Informed First Aid, um, there's a QR code uh, there that you can scan. And um, it's just a quick form to fill out. So I've got your details to put up on the uh, website. Um, so if you uh, want to be sort of a partner, then I'll send you the monthly newsletter. Um, and I'll send them to anyone who's registered for a talk um, anyway. Um, and also, you know, there might be ways we can work together. Um, so, for example, talks like this, uh, there might be other events. Um, and um, also, if anyone's actually interested in helping me to develop the uh, sort of trauma-informed first aid training, um, I guess it is quite challenging to make something so sort of related to a trauma um, do that in a trauma-informed way. So, you know, if anyone does have any ideas or would like to work with me on that, 
um, please do sort of get in touch. Um, um, so finally, um, it's just an option to have a chat uh, to some of the other people on the call. Um, uh, so you might choose to add uh, some ideas to the whiteboard um, as you chat. And I'm just going to open up some breakout rooms uh, so that you could, um, if you wanted to stay on the call, um, choose one of these um, rooms to go into. Um, anyone leaving the call now? Um, we have covered some quite sort of um, heavy topics um, in the uh, webinar. So I would recommend maybe trying out um, some of the things we learned about today or whatever um, works for you um, in, in terms of, sort of your sort of well-being and um, sort of uh, self-help care. So personally, I'm going to be doing um, a nice yoga practice after this just to sort of wind down before bed. Very important. Um, just to sort of bring your attention to this last box here. So um, the sort of number one, I guess, provider of well-being for you is going to be you. So by um, the time we're adults or even as kids, we, we might know what uh, our favourite well-being practice is already. So are we someone who likes to do some yoga? Um, do we like to read a book before bed? Um, aromatherapy? Um, so it's sort of thinking about what has helped you before to sort of um, stay within that window of tolerance that we talked about at, at the beginning there. And um, yeah, making sure that, um, yeah, you're getting a good night's sleep and uh, you're um, going about your life in a way where there's good well-being. So um, if you'd like to stay on the call, um, then I've opened up the breakout rooms. And if you would like to leave, thanks very much for joining today's call. And um, I hope you found it sort of useful um, in, in some way. So please do share the link um, to anyone you think might uh, benefit from the, this uh, recording when it's made available. Um, thanks very much, everyone. So the, the breakout rooms are now open. Uh, if you go to the more icon, um, I think you should be able to select a breakout room to join. Um, and um, then um, have a chat with whoever's in that room. And if there's not many of us, we might just come back to this room and have a little bit of networking before I close the webinar. Also, if anyone would like uh, some mental health first aid, um, then, you know, do chat with me um, independently. Um, uh, we, we can, um, yeah, have a conversation if I can signpost you to any resources uh, which you think might be particularly beneficial for you. Um, so, yep, uh, over to the chat, um, the, the breakout rooms, if you would like to uh, join in any of those discussions. And um, good night um, to everybody else.